Chris Doyle joins me now. He's the director of the Council for Arab-British Understanding, and he joins us live from London. Thank you for being with us on the program. Now, there are increasing calls for a ceasefire to be put into effect. The West is saying that a ceasefire will only benefit Hamas, while thousands of innocent civilians continue to be killed by Israeli airstrikes. What's your take on the U.S. and the U.K.'s position on a ceasefire? The biggest beneficiary of a ceasefire will be the civilian population, the 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, who right now are living in quite shocking conditions, uh, running out of food, food, water, fuel, where we have hospitals being shut down, uh, shut down, where we have UN operations about to end. So absolutely, a ceasefire is desperately needed. And it's quite astonishing to see the way in which you know, senior Western politicians refuse to endorse that. If you're not prepared to go for a ceasefire, then at least call for a humanitarian pause, which the French have been speaking about, because you you can't deliver aid. There have all these countries that have pledged aid, including the United States. Britain increased its pledge of aid yesterday. What's the point of pledging aid if you cannot get it into Gaza, distribute it around Gaza to those in need? The little trickle of aid that has been able to get over the Rafa border since the weekend is three, maybe four percent of what was getting into Gaza beforehand. What we are seeing is highly risky. Let's play out the scenarios. If you don't have a ceasefire, you're probably going to have a ground invasion. If you have a ground invasion, probably those Israeli hostages, a lot of them will, will get killed awfully, and you risk regional escalation. If you get a ceasefire, well, then you have a chance to get some of those hostages, hopefully all of them released. You have a chance to build on that ceasefire, maybe find some political arrangement to end once and for all the carnage that's going on, and you avoid, hopefully, that risk of regional escalation. So it makes absolutely no sense to let this continue in the way that it is. Why has it been difficult for the Arab world, do you think, to use their diplomatic strength in these ceasefire negotiations? When you're up against the United States and key European actors, you essentially reach a blockage where there are countries who wish to call for that. We've heard the UN Secretary General doing it. We've heard the Pope calling for this. But when you have many other leading states not so enthusiastic or opposing, of course, this just leads to a logjam. What that means then is that you get no ceasefire. That's the, the default. So it's extremely unfortunate. What I would also say is that we're probably in the next few days going to see some yet further, even worse, heartbreaking scenes. If we can't get that water in, if we can't get the fuel and the power on, we're going to see many more innocent civilians dying in the most extraordinarily horrific fashion. And I think the pressure on those leaders to call for a ceasefire will actually gather momentum. It'll get even worse. So it's much better to do this now, try to prevent further loss of civilian life. And I would also say this to Israeli listeners, uh, viewers, because in the end, there are five, six million Palestinians living in and around Israel. Mm -hmm. And you've got to live with them. Uh, you know, when all of this is done and carrying on with a ground invasion and further bombing will engender a situation of almost internal right. hatred. Chris, you mentioned, that... you mentioned hostages. Netanyahu has been receiving a lot of backlash for not doing enough for the release of the hostages to the extent where he has declined Hamas's repeated offers of freeing hostages in return for fuel and humanitarian aid. What do you think Netanyahu's goal is here? What does he hope to accomplish by the end of all of this? I think you have to differentiate between Netanyahu and the rest of the Israeli government because he has his own specific uh, agendas. I think that Israel, Israeli public rightly holds him responsible for much of this. He has been basically trying to avoid any possibility that he can be held accountable. So he needs this conflict to go ahead because the moment that this conflict ends or gets into a pause, then he faces his day of reckoning. And of course, if he's no longer prime minister, he may well land up in jail. The rest of the Israeli government are divided in what they see as the end game. This was a question that Joe Biden asked them. So some would uh, like to see 
uh, the ground invasion. Others would actually like to bring about a situation perhaps where large numbers of Palestinians are forcibly uh, evicted into Egypt. We've seen also the Israeli foreign minister, for example, saying that Gaza should be much smaller at the end of all of this. Does that mean that some of them want to acquire and confiscate, annex more Palestinian land, of course, illegal in international law? But there is confusion as to what the Israeli end game is. What does victory look like? And I remind you that there's a difference between defeating Hamas, where Hamas in some ways surrenders, raises the white flag, that can definitely happen. It's under a lot of pressure. And eradicating Hamas. Now, you cannot eradicate an ideology. You cannot do that with bombs and bullets. It won't work. So the language we have seen from Israeli leaders is very, very chilling mm -hmm. in what they say they're going to do to Gaza. Nobody in the international community, certainly in the West, is calling that out. Director at the Council for Arab-British Understanding, Chris Doyle, thank you for your time. We appreciate it.